Hi, Hansen here and welcome to another Kingdom 101 teaching. I bring you greetings from Archippus Awakening, a ministry that is dedicated to the awakening of saints that we may know and fulfill our God-given Kingdom assignments. Now, how do we do that? We need strong Kingdom foundations and this is where Kingdom 101 comes in. Through this teaching, I hope that you will know Jesus as King all over again, that you will embrace the things of His Kingdom and I pray that you will know how to move on your kingdom assignments, that you can receive them and be faithful in all that God assigns to you. And so let's pray together and let's jump right in. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, will you reveal Jesus to us today? And I pray for hearts to be ready to receive and to respond in the correct way. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you asked this question before? Lord, show me your glory. Has that been your request? Or you're asking the Lord to show you a revelation of some sort? And I want to believe that God in His mercy, by His grace, in His time, He would have given you glimpses of the truth and shown you things of things to come perhaps or how He wants you to respond in the correct manner. You know, everybody loves a good revelation. But the question is, what is this revelation for? What are we going to do if God shows us something? You know, how do we respond? And that's what I hope to be able to address through this teaching. Our text is taken from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 13, but it really starts in Matthew 16, that last verse in verse 28. For that, let's review Matthew 16 first before we jump into the text proper. In Matthew 16, we meet Jesus and the disciples in this place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, that's where Peter declares Jesus as the Messiah. Well, later on, Jesus reveals an upcoming suffering and even death, as well as his resurrection. But Peter rebukes Jesus, and Jesus calls Peter Satan. Well, Jesus goes on then, and he explains what it really means to follow him and how faithful disciples will be rewarded when the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father. Hold on to this line. But the disciples will be asking in their hearts at least, you know, how, how is this going to happen if Jesus was going to be killed? I mean, what glory is there? Can you see it's easy to miss the most important details? Jesus did say, I will be raised on the third day. But you see, for the disciples, it was difficult for them to accept that Jesus must first suffer and die. And that is why the Lord continues in the next verse, Matthew 16, 28. He assures them with these words, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. I know this verse is right at the end of Matthew 16, but it is best understood together with Matthew 17 verses 1 to 13, which speaks about the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, I'll give you at least three simple points or three reasons why the commentators and I believe that they must be read together that we can have a better understanding. Firstly, all three synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three link this prediction with the event of the transfiguration. Secondly, Jesus said some standing here. And later we will see that Jesus only brought some, just three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they saw the transfiguration. Thirdly, the proclamation that the Son of Man will be coming in His kingdom really refers to the transfiguration where Jesus reveals His own glory as the King and also gives a glimpse of what the kingdom, the glory of the kingdom would be all about through this transfiguration. So you can see that Jesus, from this one verse, and then in Matthew 17, 1 to 13, Jesus gives the disciples a sneak peek up on the peak, a glimpse of his glory. Now, if Matthew 16 was considered a high point in Matthew's gospel where Peter declares Jesus as the Messiah, then Matthew 17 is an even higher point where Jesus himself displays the glory of Messiah. This would be the peak, as it were, because after this, 
all the way to Jerusalem and the cross, it's going to be pretty much downhill. This peak, this high point will establish Jesus as much as it will also encourage the disciples for what is to come. But it's not only for them, it was also for Israel. Now, we must remember, right, when we look through Matthew, the author, Matthew himself, was writing to the Jews, the people of the king, so that he can present Jesus without doubt that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the king. But this episode is also important as an encouragement for us. And so through this teaching, I want to do it in two parts. Part one is to look at an Old Testament perspective, understanding, because this passage has got many, many Old Testament allusions which would be very familiar to the Jews. And we see them all fulfilled in Jesus. It also shows us that the Old Testament continues into the New Testament. It's not two stories as we see old and new, but it is one kingdom story. And Jesus is the one that will be glorified in this episode. He is postured and positioned almost like a Moses, but more. He's a greater Moses. He is the new Moses. And as much as the people of Israel looked up to Moses as a leader, Jesus is the new Moses now. He is the king of glory. Now in part two, we're going to look at then what are the lessons, some implications we can draw from this account. Um, it's great to learn about the transfiguration, look at the revelations, a glimpse of the glory. But what is it about? What is it for? How are we to respond? And I hope to give you some practical points that you can take away and that you can apply also. And so let's start with the first part. Let's look at the Old Testament allusions as well as the fulfillment. I love the scriptures because it is so consistent. What happened before made the people may not fully understand it, but we see it revealed later on in the person of Jesus Christ right through in the New Testament. So I'm going to pull out some words from this passage and we're going to see an Old Testament mention of it and see how the two coincide and how one reveals another and one fulfills the other also. Firstly, high mountain. We see in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus brings the disciples and they go up a high mountain. Now, in the same way, Moses also, you will always find him on Mount Sinai, on the mountain of God. Even for Elijah, which we will meet again later, he is also found in Mount Horeb, having a conversation or an encounter with God. And so these high mountains, these are high places, often associated with worship and the revelations of God. And here we see Jesus, Moses, even Elijah, always on a high mountain. This is the first parallel or the first association between what happened for Moses as well as now what is happening with Jesus. Point number two, it would be after six days on the seventh day that Jesus would bring the disciples up onto the mountain. Now, another very familiar phrase, because Moses himself, when he was up on the mountain of God, it is recorded in Exodus chapter 24, verse 15 and 16, that the cloud covered it for six days. And then on the seventh day, Moses has the conversation with God. And so can you see one more time, Matthew is recording this and God's timing is so perfect where there's a consistency between what happened with Moses and now what is happening with Jesus. Point number three, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother. Now Jesus didn't go up himself. Now in the same way for Moses, he also did not go up himself. Exodus chapter 24 verse 13 tells us that Moses arose with his assistant Joshua. Now the elders were all with them, but he tells the elders, now you stay here, wait for us here until we come back to you. So it was just Moses bringing Joshua up and here you have Jesus bringing his disciples up. And my question on the side is, who are you bringing up? Who are you bringing along? That's discipleship, isn't it? Point number four, his face shone. 
Does it sound familiar? Moses up on the mountain when he had a time with the Lord, he came down and his face was also shining with the glory of God. Except there's one little difference. Well, actually, it's a big difference. Not only was Jesus' face shining, his entire body was also shining. Glory was radiating from the inside out, so much that his clothes were as white as snow. And it was just in a moment, it was time when he was there, he was praying, and he started to manifest this glory. Moses had to wait 40 days and 40 nights before the skin of his face would shine while he talked with God. But it was only the face. You see, Moses reflected the glory of God, but Jesus revealed his own glory as God as well as King. Next, we meet two Old Testament characters, Moses and Elijah. Now, you know that these two are very important characters to the people of Israel. Well, they represent two things down here. Number one, the law and the prophets. Moses as the law, Elijah as the prophet. And together, as they speak with Jesus, it is like they are handing over to Jesus because the Old Testament finds its fulfillment, its culmination in the person of Messiah, and his name is Jesus. It also shows us that there's continuity between the old and the new because, as I have said just now, they are one story, one kingdom story, and you cannot separate the two. Jesus continues what God has already begun in the old, bringing into the new right now. Now, Moses and Elijah also represent something else, two groups of people. We know that Moses died and went to be with the Lord. But Elijah was taken up and he did not experience death. And I believe that you can look at this too. um, In glory now, talking to Jesus, representing those who died but will be resurrected in glory, as well as those who will not die when the Lord comes or have not died, and they will also be in glory. And so how powerful this picture in the whole picture of glory on this mountain of transfiguration, Moses and Elijah giving us a sense, a hint of what is even to come. The next we don't find in the Gospel of Matthew, but I'm going to draw from the passage in Luke. In chapter 9, verses 30 to 31, as Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus and they appeared in glory, they spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, they were talking about his death, but the word disease in the Greek is exodus. And again, for the people of Israel, a very, very familiar term. Their exodus from Egypt was a great deliverance. And Moses, the one who brought that deliverance, now talking to Jesus about his exodus, where when Jesus dies, He's going to accomplish. It's funny, right, that they would use the word accomplish his decease. He would accomplish, he would fulfill. That's a Greek word there. He would fulfill a deliverance from sin for anyone and everyone who would put faith and trust in the name of Jesus. And so once again, an Old Testament picture, but now fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The next word is tabernacles. Matthew chapter 17, verse 4. Peter, looking at the whole situation, can't make sense of it, perhaps out of fear, out of confusion. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, some people think that uh, it might be the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, but I don't think so. This is not necessarily a reference to that Interesting, seven-day festival, and this is happening on the seventh day. Well, the prophet Zechariah did say that the coming of the kingdom, the people will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It will be the culmination of all the promises. So in a sense, it does does point to that. But not yet. The Son of Man comes into this kingdom, but before that, he has to suffer, he has to die first. So I don't know, Peter might have had the right idea but at the wrong time. But let's look at this word tabernacle because you'll see a parallel to that also. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, now 
while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud. Once again, very, very familiar Old Testament picture. Because in the Old Testament, God himself, when his glory was shining through the cloud, he overshadows the tabernacle. And so the people would have read this and understood that God would be revealing his glory and it rested on that tabernacle. But here right now on the mountain, God's glory now rests on the true tabernacle, which is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So once again, a fulfillment down there, a consistency of picture, how wonderful, how beautiful. Point number eight, and if you're still with me, the two words, hear him. The voice out of that cloud, God's voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses told the people of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Can you see once again, from Moses to the new Moses, from a leader that they used to look up to, in Matthew, God is saying now through Matthew, this gospel, come on people, it's no longer the old Moses, it's the new Moses. His name is Jesus. He's not just the, the one that you revere, this is my son. He is the one that you are supposed to be listening to. You listened to Moses before, it's time to listen to Jesus now. Point number nine, fear. <laughs> when the disciples heard it and they saw the glory around them, they fell on their faces and they were greatly afraid. In the same way, back in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 34, verse 30, when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Well, the disciples were afraid, the people of Israel were afraid because when the glory of God shines, they respond in the same way. That is, there's fear, there's worship, and they fall down on their faces. So very, very familiar pictures. And I believe God was using this picture to show the people the continuity again of scriptures and the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And finally, point 10, and I give you two words here, glory and grace. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, Jesus came and touched the disciples and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Suddenly the glory was gone. Why? Because Jesus only gave a peek, a glimpse of his glory. He knew when to reveal his glory and he also knew when to conceal his glory. Because like God, no one can take the fullness of that glory. You remember in Exodus 33, Moses himself asked God, Lord, show me your glory. And God said to him, you can't take the fullness of this glory. No man can see my glory and still live. But did God suddenly just move away and not show him anything? No. In verse 21, the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And so it shall be when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and I'll take away my hand, and you shall see my back, a glimpse of my glory as it were, but my face shall not be seen. You see, the fullness of the glory is just too much for us to bear. But I thank God that in that fullness, there is also grace that is there for us. And Jesus was so gentle with his disciples. He would assure them, touch them, and just tell them, it's okay, I'm here. You can arise right now. You know, Arise, do not be afraid. Because the glory is there, but so is also grace for you. In the same way, Moses wanted to see the fullness of the glory of God. But God in his grace also revealed just a glimpse of his glory to Moses. You know, I remember John chapter 1, verse 14. Remember, John was up on that mountain seeing the glory of Jesus. And he wrote this, When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Here we see the truth of His majesty, the glory, but juxtaposed with the grace of His majesty. But unlike Moses, Jesus' glory wasn't a fading glory. Moses had to wear a veil to cover what was fading, and he would have to go back into God's presence to sort of recharge to get back that glory and that shine again. No, Jesus' glory is not a fading glory. He only concealed it for that moment. We know that His glory is an eternal glory. So here we see a picture of Moses' temporary glory giving way to Jesus' everlasting glory. So I hope you can see the beautiful, beautiful picture and the consistency of the Old Testament passing on into the New Testament. Ten simple points for you to see again that God has already started something in the time of Israel but bringing to a completion in the time of Jesus as a new Moses and constituting, instituting a new Israel. Let's go on to part two. And we want to see what are the lessons and the applications we can draw from this passage. Well, it's one thing just to say it's nice we see the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. But what does it mean for us? How are we to respond when God shows us things and gives us a sneak peek, a glimpse of His glory, a revelation of things to come? I want to share five quick points with you and I hope that that will be helpful for you too. Firstly, mark your milestones, but don't make monuments out of them. I love the peaks, the high points, the mountaintop experiences that the Lord allows me to have. And it's very tempting. I would love to stay there forever if I can. <laughs> Peter, when he had that experience, he wanted to build three tabernacles. He told the Lord, it is good for us to stay here, to be here. Let's camp here forever. Don't let this moment pass. If we could, we would do the same also, right? But you see, these manifestations, these sneak peeks that the Lord gives to us, our peak experiences, the mountaintop experiences, they are not for us to camp there. They are markers for our mission. In fact, it should push us forward. These experiences are to encourage us, to anchor us for our spiritual walk as well as our kingdom assignments. If you have a high point, a revelation, remember this. Revelations are often given for our recalibration. In our terms, we would say, if there's an awakening, make sure we follow up with an aligning. But what comes after an aligning would always be the assigning. And so mark your milestones. I go back to my milestones often because I'm encouraged by them. I'm stirred by them all over again. But as much as I can remember them, I'm not to rest in them. I'm to move forward because God has new things for me. And these experiences move me towards the plans and the things He has for me. Isaiah, in chapter 6 of Isaiah, remember he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now, did he stay there? No way. When the Lord said, whom shall we send? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Can you see this? Mark your milestones, but don't make monuments out of them. Live from these peaks and be careful that you're not stuck on these pedestals. Secondly, process your peaks for the bigger peak picture. If God gives you a sneak peek, you may not fully understand it at that point in time. Process these high points. Process your mountaintop experiences, your spiritual highs. I mean, it's nice to receive these things, but often we need greater understanding and we also need to know the timing of the Lord. See, even after witnessing the transfiguration, it was hard for the disciples to still get the suffering and the dying of Jesus. And so they kept this word to themselves, right? Jesus explains to them, and he, they were questioning what the rising from the dead meant. I mean, they just saw the transfiguration, the glory of God shining all around them. They see a peek into the promise, but they could not understand this. They understood the part about John the Baptist, that he had to suffer and he had already died as Elijah to come. But they couldn't get the part about Jesus' suffering as well as his death. And so let's remember this. 
Whatever God shows us, the glimpses that He allows us to have, it is usually a part of a much bigger picture. That peak that we are allowed to have would give us a bigger picture that would give us a better understanding only in time to come. And that is where revelation has to be matched up also with the timing of God. Jesus told the disciples, you mustn't tell anyone anything of this and whatever you have seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. In other words, don't go posting on Facebook. Don't WhatsApp anyone right now. Don't share too quickly. Keep this to yourself. And many times we see people talking and sharing things before it's time. And that's dangerous because others may not understand, you may not understand, you may lose the context and even lose that intensity of that vision that the Lord might have shown to you. If you have to, at most, share with trusted people, like-minded kingdom people, but exercise wisdom and caution and have discernment. Process these peaks. Process the peaks that the Lord gives to you, the glimpses that He shares with you. Process with Him. Whatever prophetic word He gives, whatever direction He's guiding you, seek godly counsel and take time to process that we have understanding and that we move with His timing. I remember that many years ago, in the year 2003, the Lord gave a word from Jeremiah chapter 1 to say, you are to destroy and to rebuild. I had no idea what it meant for me. And I was trying to experiment here and trying to move it in certain ways. Of course, you understand, nothing went at all. Over time, over the next years, the Lord started to show me what that word meant. I had to pull down foundations that were wrong and rebuild and relay foundations that would be correct. I had to destroy and to rebuild. A few more years later, that became even clearer. It's not just teaching that's wrong, but teachings about the kingdom of God that we never had. We have to pull down faulty understanding, churchy beliefs, and relay with kingdom foundations. Right now, in the year 2020, just this year, the Lord shows again even greater understanding, a deeper understanding, all within the timing of His revelation. And so remember, process the peaks for a bigger peak picture. Thirdly, we are shown the kingdom so that we can enter the kingdom. And this is about making your call and election sure. We have been given a sneak peek of Jesus and His kingdom. Now, we have been shown the kingdom, we can see the kingdom, so that we can then enter the kingdom. Remember the words of in the Gospel of John, where Jesus said, to Nicodemus, you have to be born again to see the kingdom and then also to enter the kingdom. Or well, does it mean that we just believe? Is it just about faith? Now, Peter himself, who saw the manifestation of transfiguration, he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, Now give all diligence, add to your faith. See, if we are shown the things of the kingdom, then we want to make sure that we will learn how to enter the kingdom. It says, this little peak that you have, don't be short-sighted. It's for a far-ranging thing into the kingdom. Don't be short-sighted. In other words, also be fruitful. Now, don't just be diligent to add to your faith. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. So that an entrance will then be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, this is Peter, and it was also John recording about the seeing and entering. And Peter saying, Now add to your faith because you want to make your call and election sure. And here's the point see, whatever God is showing to you, it's to add on, it's to build up, it's to add point to point, you know, processing one upon the other to make that call and election sure. We've got to be moving forward from whatever He shows us. When did Peter write these words? It was at a time when he knew his life would be ending soon. And he wrote there to the church saying, I must remind you, I must remind you because when I go, I want it to be so real for you as it was real for me because my decease is coming soon. 
Is it interesting that he used the same word, my exodus is coming soon. That same word that was used of Jesus, that Moses and Elijah discussed with Jesus, his exodus, his decease. Now, Peter is saying now, this exodus, oh, I recall this, you know, when I heard Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus of the same word, the exodus, that deliverance. Now, I will be fully delivered from this earthly tent once and for all, but you've got to get this. So make your call and election sure. And I'm not making this up. He goes on. I'm, I, I'm not giving you some nice story. It's not a fable. It's not a myth. In verse 16 to 18, he refers to the transfiguration as proof. For we did not cunningly devise fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were witnesses, eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. And so if we are shown something, it's for a purpose. God is trying to remind us to say, make sure you move forward. Make sure you get to the next point. Make sure you're not short-sighted, but that you will be fruitful. Make sure that you make your call and election sure. Which brings us to the next point. We have to progress from peak to peak. We want to progress from whatever God shows us to the fullness of what God has prepared for us. See, Jesus' transfiguration points to our transformation. His transfiguration, that promise of the glory, the peak of things to come, encourages us to move on our own transformation with a promise of a glory that will be given to us. Let me give you two things down here. The word transfiguration comes from the Greek metamorpho, oh, which we, in English we use the word metamorphosis. Now, do you know that this word is only used two other times? Once in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and another time in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And this refers to the transformation that must be effected in each of us in this present life. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So right now, we should be being transformed. As our minds are renewed, we are then transformed. But is it just an intellectual exercise? No, it is by the Spirit that we are transformed. It tells us that we with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what this means is we don't just study the Bible, renew our mind with the Scriptures and then get stuck in the letter of the law. No, it is by the Spirit that we have liberty, that this veil is removed, that we behold the glory of the Lord and we are transformed, changed from glory to glory unto the image of the Lord. From a peak of the glory, we get to the fullness and the promise of that glory. Ours is also not a fading glory. It is also not even a reflected glory. Just like Jesus, the promise is given to us that we have an inside-out glory. We carry this glory in our hearts, the knowledge of the light of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And that's why it's okay if this outward man is perishing, right? As we get old, a little bit more wrinkled, losing a little bit of hair here and there. There's no more glory in the physical, but the inward man is being renewed. We may be going through tribulations, suffering, challenges in this life, but it is only a momentary affliction light affliction, it says, compared to the weightiness of the glory that we will have for all eternity. So Jesus' transfiguration should encourage us in our transformation in this life. 
But that is not all. It doesn't end there. The glimpse of the glory is a guarantee of the glory in the life to come. You see, our transformation is not for just the life that is right now. It is sowing into a transformation that would be for the life that is to come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it speaks of the resurrection of the dead. What's going to happen down there? The body is sown in corruption when we die, but it will be raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it will be raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it will be raised in power. Because at the moment when Jesus will come, at that very last trump, we will be changed. We will be transformed from the image of man to the image of of the heavenly man. Friends, how we are transformed in this life, how we move from glory to glory will determine how we will one day finally be changed in glory. For the Bible tells us, just as the celestial bodies have different levels of glory, we too, when we are raised up, depending on what we have done in this life and how we are changed, how we have sown into the things of the kingdom, we too will receive the glory that will be of that same level for us. And so be encouraged by Jesus' transfiguration that is a promise for our own transformation. And so don't just camp and stay there. We have to progress from peak, whatever God shows us right now, that we can progress to the peak, the fullness of the promise that He has for us. And finally, point number five, finish the work receive the glory. The peaks that we receive must produce a peak performance in each and every one of us. Jesus in John chapter 17 verse 4 said this, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now my Father, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. The transfiguration was to establish Jesus as king. But I believe it also encouraged and strengthened Jesus for the work that he had to accomplish on the cross. At the same time, it also encouraged and strengthened the disciples for their own mission. Friends, the peak that God gives to us is to help us move forward, that we can serve him and to glorify him on earth. I believe Jesus looked at that glory. That's why he was able to say, Oh, my Father, oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself. I'm looking to that. And when Jesus was moving towards the cross, I believe he looked beyond the cross. We are told to look to him, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, I believe there was also the glory that was there. He could see the glory beyond that cross. And because of that, he was able to endure that cross, despising the shame because he knew the glory that awaited him when he finally would complete that work, glorifying the Father, that the Father would then glorify him. My brothers and my sisters in Christ, I believe the same is expected of us. The little peaks that the Lord allows us to have, the sneak peaks, the glimpses of the glory, the revelations that He gives to us, these peaks should be pushing us towards a peak performance. Not that we're performing to Him, but that we desire to give our very best, to do our very best for the glory of God. Finish the work. Fulfill the assignment. We want to give the best to the Lord because we know we will be receiving the best from the Lord. Lord, even if we have to suffer with Him, we know that we will be glorified with Him. And so these peaks, let it push us, let it produce that peak performance in each and every one of us. My brothers and my sisters, I exhort you, encourage you, finish the work, receive the glory. Let's bring this teaching to a close. I started by asking you, have you asked the Lord to show you his glory. Have you been asking for revelations? Maybe you have received prophetic words. He has shown you things, great and mighty things even. What are these for? What have you done with all that the Lord has shown you? What have you done with the sneak peeks 
What have you done with the high moments, the mountaintop experiences that you have experienced over and over again? Can I encourage you to respond, to move from these? Can I encourage you and remind you once more? Mark these milestones, but don't make monuments out of them. Move forward from whatever the Lord has shown to you. Learn how to process these peaks for the bigger picture. Seek the Lord for understanding. Wait for His perfect timing. Have you been shown the kingdom? If so, this is to help you enter the kingdom. Make your call and election sure. Be diligent. Add to your faith so that you will be fruitful in the things of our Lord and the things of His kingdom. Progress from peak to peak. Don't stay where you are. Keep growing from glory to glory. Remember, Jesus' transfiguration is a promise and an encouragement for our own transformation, not just in this life, but also in the life to come. The glimpse of what He's showing us right now is a guarantee of what we will receive. And so I encourage you, live for the glory of God, work for His glory, finish the work that He has given to us, fulfill the assignment, and finally receive the glory that is due and waiting for us. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your grace even as you show your glory. They are there not just to make us feel good, they are there to encourage us so that we can move forward for your name and for your purposes. Lord, I pray that as much as we are excited of the, for the high moments, Lord, and for these spiritual milestones, May we never camp upon these and not move on. But I pray that these would help us recalibrate a line that we can then be assigned for you and to live for the glory of your name. And help us, O Lord, because like the disciples, we need help to process these things, to have understanding and to move according to your timing. I thank you that there's always grace, but Lord, you bring others to journey with us too. So help us, Lord, and may all we do and all that we say, as we move from glory to glory, bring all glory and praise to you and you alone, Lord Jesus, the King of glory. We bless you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me for another Kingdom 101 teaching. Until the next time, this is Hanson signing off. God bless you.